Hi everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Chitendo. This episode is with Chris Stringer. Chris is a renowned paleoanthropologist and a leading expert in the study of human evolution. He is a researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. He is best known for his work on the origins and evolution of modern humans. In the discussion, we will talk about the topics of evolution of sapiens, the development of modern humans, the reasons for our unique existence and making projections about the future of human evolution. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the podcast. Yes, it's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start uh, from from the major question. Uh, where did the um, Homo sapiens first appear and when was it? Okay, yeah. Well, of course, the, that begs the first question, what is Homo sapiens? So people use this in different ways. So for me, it's obviously the members of the human species today and our ancestors going back to our common ancestor with our nearest relatives in the fossil record, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So for me, there's a line of ancestors stretching back. And I actually call all of those Homo sapiens until we get to that common ancestor, which could have been five or 600,000 years ago. So in the immediate past, there are people like us who look like us. And we have these features in our skeleton. So, for example, in our skull, we have a high and rounded skull and small brow ridges, a small face tucked under the brain case. We have a, a chin on the lower jaw and we have a lightly built skeleton with a, a rather narrow rib cage and a narrow pelvis. So these are all features in the skeleton that we can look for in fossils to trace our lineage back in time. Uh, and in my view, we can get back to at least 200,000 years ago in Africa, and there we can find a skeleton in Ethiopia at Omo Kibish, which, at least in the parts preserved, looks like a, a Homo sapiens, a derived Homo sapiens, similar to us today. So at least 200,000 years in Africa, we can go back and find something we can call derived Homo sapiens, something like us today. But beyond that, there are then more primitive Homo sapiens, things which don't show all the features we find in people today, but nevertheless appear to be on our lineage. And then there are fossils such as Jebel Ihud from Morocco, uh, Florisbad from South Africa. So these things push us back to maybe 300,000 years, still, in my view, on the Homo sapiens lineage. And then when we go further back, then it becomes much more difficult to trace what is a Homo sapiens, because the features are much less developed. So there's a fossil from Tanzania, from an Ndutu, from Ndutu, which could be 500,000 years old. For me, it looks like it could be a Homo sapiens, but it's rather damaged. It's not very complete, so we can't be sure. So, yeah, it gets more difficult, but certainly I think we can trace our line at least 300,000 years in Africa. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's also interesting that how uh, just by studying humans, we can, because I think this also begs uh, the understanding of what is a species, when does a species become a species, etc. right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, of course, nobody doubts that today we've only got one human species. We come in many sizes, shapes and colors. But if we strip away all the superficial features and look at the DNA and look at the skeleton, then yeah, we have these shared features and no, no problem there recognizing what is Homo sapiens. Um, and alongside us 70,000 years ago, there were at least four other kinds of humans and that's difficult for us to grasp. You know, there's only one human around today. 70,000 years ago, we'd been evolving in Africa. The Neanderthals had been evolving in Europe and Asia. These people, the Denisovans were over in the Far East and Southeast Asia probably. Um, and then on the islands of Southeast Asia, there are these weird wolf human species, Homo floresiensis, the so-called hobbit, and um, the or Luzon, Homo luzonensis in the Philippines. So there was all this diversity, and the further we go back, we see even more diversity. This strange species, Homo naledi, that was around in South Africa maybe 300,000 years ago. We don't know when it disappeared. It could have gone on 
as well, younger in time, uh, to overlap much more with Homo sapiens. So there's a lot of complexity and diversity in the past. I would regard those things as different species. Some people, you know, like to make a larger, broader definition of Homo sapiens. They would include Neanderthals in Homo sapiens. For me, that dilutes the species idea tremendously because then you've got something that really looks very different from us today. Um, so I don't agree with calling them Homo sapiens, but it's tricky because we now know they interbred with us. They interbred with our ancestors. Um, and obviously I, at school, I was taught the biological species concept in my biology lessons that species are reproductively isolated from each other. They don't interbreed and have fertile offspring. In the case of us and Neanderthals, clearly it happened. In the case of us and the Denisovans, clearly it happened, which is why, you know, I am, and I'm pretty sure you have got Neanderthal DNA in your in your genome from that interbreeding, maybe 40 or 50,000 years ago. So what happens is, of course, that you know, these species concepts are humanly created. We we create, you know, what we call species. Nature has its own way of working. And so it actually takes mammal and bird species sometimes millions of years to develop enough diversity and difference to become really distinct, reproductively isolated. We and Neanderthals have been separate maybe 600,000 years. And so like what we call species of baboons, what we call species of bears, like brown bears and polar bears, what we call um, species of dogs like jackals and wolves, they can hybridize, and yet they do seem to be good species. I think it's the same for us in Neanderthals. We were still close enough related that interbreeding was still possible. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And um, of course, we can talk more about it, like uh, uh, what is the, the, the meaning of species, etc. But let's uh, talk a little bit more about other hominins. So what, what are mm -hmm. hominins, uh, first of all? Uh, and um, when did the first hominin appear? Right, yes. Yeah. So yeah, going back a lot further back now, we talked about 70,000 years and 200,000, 300,000. Now we're going to go back maybe 7 million years. So we obviously have our ancestry in humans, and even the term human is disputed, what we call a human. So in my view, a human is a member of the genus Homo. So we're human, Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals are human, Homo erectus, an earlier species is human. But when we go back beyond 2 million years, we meet things which are not in the genus Homo, things like Australopithecus, the so-called southern apes. And if we push back even further, we get to things which are much less like us. They're, they're much more like apes in their biology. And geneticists estimate we had a common ancestor with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, maybe 7 million years ago. And there are different estimates. Some put it younger, some put it further back. But let's say around 7 million years for the last common ancestor, when our line split and the line of chimpanzees and bonobos split, so everything on that line afterwards is a hominin. So we are hominins, the Australopithecines, the southern apes are hominins. And there are fossils from Africa that date in this period from about 4 million to 7 million years ago, which many people consider to be hominins. They say, you know, they think they're on our lineage after we split, but they're controversial because they, they show many primitive features. So... Uh, there's a creature called Sahelanthropus, which is known from Chad. Now, what is now Sahara Desert, uh, six or seven million years ago, had lakes and rivers and trees, um, and there were sort of ape-like creatures there. And there's a skull and some bones of the skeleton of this creature called Sahelanthropus. And it was quite small, probably a chimpanzee size, maybe a bit smaller. And the skull is got a huge brow ridge and a, an ape-sized brain, but the canine teeth are, are a bit smaller, which is a hominin feature. And the base of the skull suggests that it rested its skull on the backbone in the way that we do, suggesting it was walking on two legs. Now, not everyone agrees with that, you know, distinction that it's really present and you can tell for sure because the skull is a bit distorted. Um, 
and there were some leg bones that were found with it. In fact, uh, sorry, yeah, there's there's one leg bone and there are two arm bones that have been found with this skull of Sahelanthropus. And the femur, the thigh bone, you know, is usually quite informative about whether a creature is walking upright on two legs or not. And unfortunately for this thigh bone, this femur, there are studies which suggest that it was a bipedal walker. That would make it pretty certainly a hominin. Other studies suggest that actually it's not so clear and it might have been a bit more like a chimpanzee uh, in the white wall. So we can't, I think, you know, the jury is still out on Saharanthropus, whether it really is a hominin. And then we move on a bit in time. There's a thing in Kenya called Orrorin tugenensis, known from fragmentary fossils, jaws and teeth, and again, bits of leg bones. And there, experts argue that the leg bones show that it was walking upright um, and that the teeth show there was canine reduction. So that could be a hominin at around five or six million years. And then there's something called Ardipithecus from Ethiopia. And Ardipithecus dates from four to five million years ago. Again, seems to have small canines. Um, the pelvis seems to show a sort of human shape to it. It's, it's shorter and wider than the pelvis of a chimpanzee or a gorilla, suggesting it could walk upright. But interesting, when you get to the feet, there are still divergent big toes, which is an ape-like feature, which we have lost. So this is a creature which would not have walked upright in the way we do. With those kind of feet, it would not have walked upright in a, in a really human way. So is that a hominin? Probably, but again, there is d dispute about it. After we get past 4 million years, we've got creatures, these Australopithecines, southern apes, and they clearly are walking upright. And we've even got footprints of them preserved uh, over three and a half million years old from Lytoli. So they certainly were walking upright um, more than three million years ago. And they are hominins, still ape-like in some ways. Their brain size is ape-like. Their shoulders and long arms suggest they're still spending a lot of time in the trees. But on the ground, they can walk upright on two legs in a similar way to us. So, so basically, um, humans and uh, some sort of um, ancestors of chimpanzees, they, they uh, branch off around 7 million years ago. Yes, uh, they evolve in Africa mostly. Yes, so that divergence we assume happened in Africa. There are some people who place it even in Europe or Asia, but the most likely situation is an African divergence. <clears throat> And obviously, there's then a long evolution of the chimpanzee and bonobo lineage. And we have no fossil evidence of that evolution, really, to speak of. There are a few little fragments. Um, and of course, some people think that even, let's say, Sahelanthropus might be more closely related to chimpanzees than to humans. And, and you know, that's possible. So somewhere there will be a fossil lineage for the chimpanzee lineage, but there's much less evidence of it than we've got for the human lineage at the moment. Yeah, but but the later on other um, hominins they appear also in Africa, which um, have at least bipedalism and some sort of uh, characteristics uh, like humans. Yes, that's uh, right. Uh, yes. So these Australopithecines I mentioned, and then we come on to um, possible early humans. So things like Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis. These are in Africa. Um, and then the very well-known species Homo erectus, which is actually a very widespread species. It's present in Africa. Um, it's present in Asia. It's present in China, for example. It's present in Java, in Indonesia. So that's a very widespread species. Uh, soon after 2 million years ago, it, on the conventional view, that species originated in Africa. And it then spread out soon after 2 million years. It spread out to Western Asia. We find it at Dominici. Uh, in the Caucasus, in, in Georgia, uh, some you know, small-bodied forms of Homo erectus, still very small brain, making very primitive stone tools. And we find rather similar things early on in Java and also in China. Um, we don't know about erectus in Europe. It's not sure whether it reached Europe at that early time. I think it probably did, but we don't have the evidence. So this was a widespread species. Some people think that there could have been something that got out of Africa before Homo erectus. So some people look at Homo floresiensis, this dwarf 
species on the island of Flores. Um, and it does show a strange mixture of characteristics. It's only about, the best known skeleton of this creature is only about 60,000 years old. So it's really recent. It overlaps certainly in time with Homo sapiens. Um, and yet it has primitive features in the in the pelvis, in the shoulders, arms. The feet are very strange. Um, it's got a small brain. Um, some people think that it is more primitive than Homo erectus and that its ancestors got to Flores a very long time ago and came from a dispersal from Africa before the Homo erectus dispersal. So it came from something like an Australopithecus that got out of Africa, made its way all the way over to the Southeast Asia and survived, you know, remote on these remote islands, perhaps Homo lusinensis is another example. And so these creatures represent an earlier stage of evolution that's been preserved by being isolated on islands, preserved for two million years, essentially, which is an incredible story if it's true. Other people have a less radical view. Other people say, actually, these might be related to Homo erectus. They represent early forms of Homo erectus that somehow arrived in the Philippines and arrived on Flores, became isolated, and then dwarfed down in size. And even their brain size got smaller uh, in line with their body size getting smaller. So they're not a very, very early relic of human evolution. They're actually a dwarf form of Homo erectus. That's a that's less radical as a view, uh, and we really don't know uh, what is the answer. We don't know where those species came from and how they fit into the picture. But the fascinating thing is that uh, Homo sapiens are the, not the only one which moved out of Africa, right? Like these are the other species that you mentioned, uh, Floresiensis or that's right. erectus yes. that they went out. And we come on later on and there are later species. So in Spain, we have a thing called Homo antecessor, so-called pioneer man. That creature is around in Spain. It's only known from one site at the moment, at Puerca in northern Spain, dating from about 850,000 years. And it seems a more derived species than Homo erectus. Um, we don't have very complete material of it, but it looks like it's more derived in the teeth and the jaws and in the skull than erectus. That's in Europe then at 850,000. Um, and over in the Far East, uh, we have... Um, in China, a group of humans that are not Neanderthal, um, they're not Erectus, they're not Homo sapiens, there's something different. Um, and the best preserved example of that comes from uh, a site in northern China, northeastern China from Harbin. And I was privileged to be involved in studying that with Chinese colleagues a couple of years ago. And this is a very derived human, it's got a very large brain, it's got a face that looks very human, very like a Homo sapiens face, and yet it's got massive brow ridges and a long, low brain case. So it seems to be another kind of human, not Neanderthal, not sapiens, evolving in China, probably existing in China for hundreds of thousands of years. What to call it? Well, my Chinese colleagues named this as a new species, so the popular name is Dragon Man. Um, and in their view, this represented a, a distinct species of human, um, Homo longi, dragon man. Uh, in my view, the analyses we did showed that it actually was quite similar to another Chinese fossil from Dali, and that actually has got a species name already, not widely used, Homo daliensis. So in my view, this skull represents Homo daliensis. So that adds another kind of human to the analyses that we've talked about. And then there's the Denisovans. We haven't talked much about them yet, but this is a, a group of humans that were identified actually mainly from their, their DNA. So Russian archaeologists have been digging Denisova Cave in Siberia for 50 years or so, and then found fragmentary human remains, um, big sized teeth. But apart from that, you couldn't really tell what kind of human they were. Um, and when geneticists analysed this material, um, the DNA was not Neanderthal-like, it was not Homo sapiens-like, it was distinct, seems to be a bit more closely related to Neanderthals than to Homo sapiens, but it looks like a, a completely distinct kind of human that's become known as the Denisovans. And we know from DNA in Denisova Cave, they were there for a couple of hundred thousand years. At times, Neanderthals were in the cave as well, 
and later on Homo sapiens was in the cave. So these Denisovans are known from whole genomes of high quality, um, and remarkably, just as we have Neanderthal DNA in us today from ancient interbreeding, people in Asia and especially in Southeast Asia and Australasia, they have Denisovan-like DNA in their genomes. So these Denisovans must have interbred with the ancestors of Homo sapiens over in the Far East and in Southeast Asia, and their DNA lives on as well as Neanderthal DNA. So there's this interesting issue that you've got on DNA, the Denisovans, and you've got in China these fossils, which could be called Dragoman or Homodaliensis. So it would make perfect sense if they were the same thing. Um, and some people think, yeah, let's just call them all the same thing. They're all Denisovans. These Chinese fossils represent Denisovans. And some or many of them probably do. But until we get really complete fossils with, with the complete Denisovan DNA sequence, we can't be sure. Um, there could be more diversity in, in China. Uh, and there's this skull from India, uh, from Namada, maybe 300,000 years old, not well dated. Again, it's not a modern human. It's not a Neanderthal. Seems to be a different kind of human. Is that a Denisovan or is it yet more diversity in Asia? that we are only just beginning to pick up. So many questions about this. So it would simplify things if those Chinese fossils were Denisovans, but I don't think we can go too fast with that. We need more data and people are working on it. So I'm sure in the next few years, we will get answers to these questions and we will be able to tell that at least some of those fossils in China are Denisovans. And I didn't mention a jawbone from the Tibetan plateau of China, uh, from Xiaohe, and that is a very robust jawbone, more than 150,000 years old. Um, unfortunately, couldn't get DNA from it, but the scientists who started it were able to get some protein material from it. And that protein material suggests that that jawbone is probably a Denisovan. So the Denisovans were also on the Tibetan plateau of China more than 150,000 years ago. Um, and so they were, we know they were a widespread species, and we know from the DNA that is present in such large amounts down in Southeast Asia, that Denisovan-like people weren't just up in Siberia, they must have spread at an early time down into Southeast Asia. And they were probably quite diverse. The bits of DNA in modern people that come from these Denisovan ancestors is actually different from the Denisovan DNA in Denisovan cave. So the Denisovans are quite diverse, they were widespread. Um, if some of these Chinese fossils are Denisovans, even more widespread. And they were probably living at high altitude on the Tibetan plateau, even 150,000 years ago. So a remarkable story. We still need to learn a lot about these uh, ancient Denisovans. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so you already mentioned like few tools that you guys use. So maybe we can briefly talk about uh, those tools. So fossils, um, some anatomical uh things that you mentioned, but also DNA sequencing, et cetera, maybe proteomics in, in that sense, yes. uh, where so, you mentioned about proteins. So what are the tools that, that, that you're using? Yes. So uh, when you say tools, do you mean actually artifacts are we talking about, or you mean scientific tools? No, the scientific tools. Right. Yeah, the scientific tools. Yeah. So obviously, you know, I'm a, I, I work on fossils or morphology, but I collaborate with people who are doing dating work, who are studying stone tools, who work on DNA and now working on proteomics. So, I mean, DNA has made a huge difference to our field. Of course it has. Um, when you think back, you know, when I did my PhD, we had the stone tools and we had the fossils and that's all there was. And so there were all these arguments about whether Neanderthals were our ancestors, could we have interbred with them? And this, the arguments were round around in circles and we never, we couldn't solve them. Now the advent of DNA means that we really can answer it some of these questions. And we have the interesting situation. So, you know, my PhD was about determining whether we evolved from Neanderthals. And that was probably the dominant view back in the 1970s, that the Neanderthals were our direct ancestors. So if we could see a complete sequence of fossils in Europe, we would see the Neanderthals gradually changing to become Homo sapiens. And you would see the same thing in Western Asia. There, the Neanderthals there were gradually evolving into Homo sapiens. So my PhD suggested that 
it wasn't that simple that there, there wasn't a sequence to Homo sapiens. But in the 1970s, I couldn't say where we originated. Uh, I could say we didn't originate from Neanderthals, probably not. They're unlikely ancestors, but I couldn't say where we evolved from. And now the DNA shows us this really complicated thing that, sure, we didn't evolve from Neanderthals, but they are partly our ancestors. So we have this kind of really quite complex picture that, you know, we did not evolve. Neanderthals did not transform into Homo sapiens, but their DNA has come into us and it's part of our genome. It's part of our ancestry. So you and I have got Neanderthal ancestors, even though we didn't evolve from them. So that's something, that complexity we couldn't have imagined 50 years ago. So the DNA has made a huge contribution in really backing up that we have a recent African origin, but it's also revealed this complexity that we are kind of hybrids in a sense, you know, part Neanderthal, part Denisovan, sub-Saharan Africans. Um, some analyses suggest that they too have got a component of interbreeding from some other kind of human that lived in Africa alongside them. And who was that? Um, was it some much more primitive form of Homo sapiens that was still hanging around? Um, there was another species I haven't mentioned yet, Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis, actually the name I prefer now for the African forms that were there three, four, five hundred thousand years ago. So this is another more primitive species of human. Um, Got a big brain, but massive brow ridges and a long, low skull and quite an angulated back to the skull, a bit like Homo erectus. And that species was around for several hundred thousand years, and we don't know when it disappeared. Um, and it was certainly around in Zambia um, 300,000 years ago. It could have lingered on longer and maybe interbred with, with early Homo sapiens. Um, that's possible. Even Homo naledi this more primitive species that we know from South Africa, could that have even interbred with, with Homo sapiens? These are, these are possibilities. Um, and I think we have to remember that Africa is a huge place uh, and our fossil record still only comes from some localities. Some, you know, I've estimated maybe only 10% of Africa has produced a decent fossil record for the last 1 million years. And yet we know from stone tools that people were living all over Africa. But for maybe 90% of Africa, we haven't got a single fossil to tell us who those people were. So a lot still to learn about Africa. And the same, of course, applies also to Asia, you know, vast areas of Asia where you've got stone tools and no fossils to tell us who was making them. And I mentioned India. You know, the whole subcontinent of India has only one decent ancient fossil from Namada. So, you know, a lot to learn there. Who was living there for hundreds of thousands over a million years, and not as and just one fossil to represent that. Yeah, that, yeah, that that was shocking for me because, um, uh, and I couldn't understand the reasons like why there is only one fossil yet. People are not working, or <laughs> there is not enough funding, or what are the reasons? Yeah, so I think it's complicated that you need you need the right circumstances to preserve fossils, and some regions geologically are just not so good. So, in Africa itself. We haven't got fossils from many parts of Africa because there just isn't the environment to preserve those fossils. So the great thing is in East Africa, you know, the continent is rifting. It's cracking open, if you like, in East Africa. And you've got these basins, these sedimentary basins of lakes and rivers, long lasting. And the sediments in there accumulate fossils and save them uh, for posterity. And today we can go there and we can read that sequence going back in time in those riverbeds and lake beds. Um, in South Africa, you've got limestone caves, which act like sign of traps. So things fall into them. Uh, and so the fossils have fallen into them over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. And the fossils have been preserved. If you don't have that situation, um, you don't get the preservation. And Namada is an example where you have a river deposit, which you know, by chance. I mean, there were lots of mammal fossils from the region and there's one human fossil. There must be more there, of course. Um, maybe they're already there sitting on someone's uh, table, <laughs> unrecognized, you know, there could be. <laughs> and so I'm sure more will be found and cave sites are being looked at. Um, lake beds would be very important. So I think it's partly circumstances and partly just people also being aware to recognize finds when they turn up. So I think that's been the great thing that in Kenya, for example, Kenyans 
you know, know about their fossil history. And so fossils that are found by a farmer or a pastoralist, you know, a herder may spot a fossil and he'll think, ah, this could be important. And they'll take it to a museum or take it to an expert to be identified. So that is that knowledge. It's that kind of awareness of the importance of the record. And in India, who knows how many fossils have turned up and have maybe just been lost because people didn't recognize their importance. So it's also a matter of education and people knowing that fossils are important, that they're at the you know, there could well be many of them around and people need to keep their eyes open for them. And I think things are going to improve and people are starting to target some of the best areas for preservation. So I'm sure we will get a lot more from the Indian subcontinent in the next few years. And it will be very exciting to see what turns up. Exactly. And um, it, it's I think it's very interesting and very important to know that how uh, crucial these uh, resources are to to have the fossils um, and to understand basically the history of life and of course not only the humans but also the other species right yes absolutely yes and because it isn't just about humans fossil mammals uh, other species are very important too they have their own evolutionary histories and they can also help us date the human fossils because of course alongside human evolution we've had the evolution of mammal species um, and they can be important in helping us date our fossil record, even without absolute, so-called absolute dating, physical dating. We can build a sequence up through time showing the evolution. And in Flores, that was done even before we had Homo floresiensis. There were stone tools that were thought to be 700,000 years old that already gave a clue that some kind of human was there making those stone tools and the mammal fossils had established that this was a, a record from close to a million years ago yeah interesting so and what about then uh finally the origins of homo sapiens so is it so in your papers you talk about this two models recent african origin or mm. multi-regional origins so what yeah. do you think which one is is yeah, so there have been these long-running debates about how Homo sapiens evolved. So I mentioned during my, you know, for my PhD, I was looking at the relationship of us and Neanderthals and testing whether Neanderthals were our ancestors. But in the 1970s, I could say fairly confidently that we didn't evolve from Neanderthals, but I couldn't say where we did evolve. There just wasn't the good evidence. There, yes, there was the Homo kibish skeleton you know, in Ethiopia that could be 100,000 years old. We now know it's actually at least 200,000 years old, but even 100,000 seemed incredible for it in the 1970s. But it was an isolated find. Even if it was a Homo sapiens, there was nothing before it that you could point to that it evolved from. Uh, because something like Jebel Ihud, I mentioned the Jebel Ihud fossils from Morocco, um, in the 1970s, they were thought to be maybe 50,000 years old. And so they were far too young to be Homo sapiens ancestors. Um, we now know they're about 300,000 years old. So the whole record in Africa was condensed. We had no way of really telling the depth of time of Homo sapiens. And we now have methods that can take us back in time and show us this hundreds of thousands of years of evolution of our lineage in Africa. Um, and there are these other models, yes. Yeah, so back in the 1980s, um, the recent African origin model started to really develop and the genetic data started to come through. Mitochondrial Eve, so-called, suggested a recent African origin. Um, but there was this other model, uh, the multi-regional model, which said that, in fact, when Homo erectus spread out, that actually was the beginning of the evolution of Homo sapiens. And in each part of the world where Homo erectus lived, it evolved through to people today. So in Europe, these early forms of humans a million years ago gradually evolved through Neanderthals to become Homo sapiens. In China, there was a sequence of humans from Homo erectus through to modern Chinese people. In Java and Indonesia, there were Homo erectus fossils a million years old, and they evolved through to become native Australians of today. And in Africa, there was a sequence of Homo erectus similarly through to Homo sapiens today. But these lines didn't separate and branch apart because they were interbreeding with each other. So people were interbreeding with each other across Africa and into Asia, and then from Asia into Europe and Asia into the Far East and Asia into Southeast Asia. So there was a network of gene flow. So they kind of kept them together, glued them together, and they evolved together 
uh, through time for more than a million years to become the Homo sapiens we find today. Um, I think that model is is wrong. Uh, I think it's been falsified. It's been disproven um, from the fossils themselves, because in my view, there is no sequence, let's say, from so-called Java man down to present day native Australians. In my view, there's no sequence from Peking man, so-called, in China through to modern Chinese people. Um, and as I've said, there's no sequence through Homo heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals to Homo sapiens in Europe. It's only in Africa, in my view, that we can probably build a sequence that goes through to Homo sapiens. Um, but even where the geographical origin, where was the, the beginning of the Homo sapiens lineage? Where was the split? So we know that we and the Denisovans and the Neanderthals are relatively closely related. We had a common ancestor maybe 600,000 years ago. Um, we don't actually know where that common ancestor lived. Uh, I used to think it probably lived in Africa, but actually we don't know. So that common ancestor could have lived, let's say, in Western Asia. And then some forms moved into Europe and became eventually Neanderthals. Some forms moved into China and Southeast Asia, uh, and they became Homo longi or Homo daliensis. Um, some forms moved then into Africa and then began the evolution of Homo sapiens. So even where the common ancestor lived, we can't be sure. That bit of the story could even have been outside of Africa, and there was an inter Africa event that began the evolution of Homo sapiens. So, yeah, we can't answer that question. The fact that Homo antecessor is located over in Spain at 850,000 years, some people see that as being close to the common ancestor of us and the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, um, possibly in China. There are fossils which I don't think are Homo erectus, which date from more than 500,000 years ago. So that lineage of what I would call Homo daliensis, it could go back to the time of Homo erectus. And we might even have a separate lineage going back maybe half a million years in China of that evolution of that, what I would call Homo daliensis lineage. It might be Denisovan lineage, if that's what they turn out to be. Um, and so even, even Eastern Asia could be a place that where the, the split occurred of the Denisovan, the Neanderthal, and the, and the Sapiens lineages. So there's a lot to learn there. It doesn't, that doesn't have to be an African bit of the story, but multi-regional evolution itself, I think, is, is falsified because we don't have these sequences in each region from a million years ago to the people we find today. I think. You know, the ancestors of Chinese people 100,000 years ago were living in Africa. The ancestors of native Australians 100,000 years ago were living in Africa. The ancestors of Europeans 100,000 years ago were living in Africa. Yeah, and the best way to settle this uh, would be uh, some sort of, I think, the, the information about their genomes or DNA, right? And so so how far we can go uh, in, in terms of getting those sequences of DNA for, for different uh, species. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Yes, if we could get um, DNA from these more ancient fossils in different regions, it would be a big help. So we've obviously got them for Denisovans going back now a couple of hundred thousand years. Um, there's even human DNA from the Semen de los Huesos in Spain, in Atapuerca, that goes back 400,000 years. So you can, under really good conditions, get DNA preservation going back a long way. Um, but that's exceptional. And for places like Africa with the warm climates, India with the warm climates, Southeast Asia with warm climates, it's unlikely we're going to get ancient DNA preservation there taking us back far enough. Um, but I mentioned proteomics. So, you know, we also have obviously our body is many, many different proteins which are produced from our DNA. And those proteins actually can survive better in many cases than DNA does. So by looking at the proteins, we're looking at a product of the genes. And of course, they differ between populations. They differ between different humans. And in some cases, they differ between different species. So in the next five years, we're going to see a great growth of research in looking at fossil proteins. And if we can get fossil proteins from Homo erectus, from Homo heidelbergensis, from Homo daliensis, from Homo naledi, um, you know, we will start to build up relationships without DNA. And that's going to be very important. And I think it is achievable. 
Uh, labs are starting on that work now. You know, it's still early days. You know, it took DNA many years to mature as a science. Uh, and I think the proteomics is in an early stage. It's going to take a few years to mature, but probably in five years' time, I think we will start to have proteomic data to help us with some of the questions that we've been talking about today. Yeah, so as a biochemist, I'm, I'm really interested in this. So uh, is there some sort of soft tissue which is preserved and that people can dissolve to get these, these, these kind of proteins? So yeah, so yeah, so they're preserved in the in the bone material itself. I mean, often linked with. I mean, if you've got collagen preservation, um, then you've you've probably, you have got you know protein preservation. Um, so you, you will get lucky. There will be some proteins that will survive better than others. Uh, but yes, bone itself, teeth, um, teeth are also seem to be a good source because you know teeth are. First of all, there's a lot of teeth in the fossil record because, in a sense, they're they're almost fossils themselves. They're mineralized, heavily mineralized already, uh, as a biological tissue. So they also contain good evidence of the proteins. So I think teeth will be an important source because it's got to be done carefully. We don't want to chop up all the all the nice fossils to just to get their proteins. It's got to be done in a in a controlled way. Um, but the work is beginning, uh, and I'm involved in, in some of it. Yeah. Nice. So after all this, uh, you know, another major question, why are we alone? Yeah, that is a, a very big question. So yes, I think that, you know, it, it is a really unusual time when we have only one kind of human around on the earth. And and why is that? And it, it's easy to point the finger at us and say, we're the reason why we're the only ones. We killed off all the others. Uh, I think that's, that's too simple a way of looking at it. Uh, certainly, the disappearance of these last surviving other species, the Neanderthals, uh, the Denisovans, if you like, um, uh, Homo floresiensis, Homo luzonensis, um, their disappearance obviously seems to coincide more or less with the spread of Homo sapiens. But we know that in Europe, for example, um, there's an overlap with Homo sapiens now, which we can map probably for you know, 15,000 years. Um, and in Western Asia, there could be an overlap that lasts 20,000 years. So the Neanderthals did not suddenly disappear when Homo sapiens appeared in their region. There was a period of coexistence. Um, and I think that the disappearance of Neanderthals was probably the result of more than one thing happening. So we know that from their DNA, we know that some Neanderthal groups were, in a sense, were in trouble. They were low in numbers and low in diversity. They were doing some... In in breeding, you know, close relatives were, were breeding with each other, which is not good for the gene pool. So it's possible Neanderthals had just suffered constant attrition from the very unstable climates that we know were around. Between, between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago, the Earth's climate was very unstable. So it kept fluctuating from nearly as warm as the present day to very cold. And some of these transitions happened very rapidly, and they happened over and over again. Every few hundred or thousand years, the climate would flip backwards and forwards. So I think the Neanderthals had trouble maintaining their numbers um, and probably this pruned their diversity. And then it wouldn't take much. A new human species comes alongside them, um, collecting the same plant resources, hunting the same animals, wanting to live in the best sites and regions. And perhaps there was an economic competition between these groups. And that may have contributed to push the Neanderthals towards extinction. And of course, it's not complete extinction. You know, their, their genome, part of it lives on in us today. So they're not completely extinct. But physical, physical extinction, we think by 40,000 years ago, as far as we know, in Europe, at least in Western Europe, they had gone. We can't time their disappearance in other regions. They might have survived longer in some places. Um, the Denisovans seem to have been around at least until 40 or 45,000 years ago. Some people think even younger in Southeast Asia. But again, they disappeared more or less coincident with the spread of Homo sapiens into their regions. So again, it could have been an economic competition. Um, but we really don't know the details. You know, there's a lot we don't understand about this. And there are other theories out there suggesting there was uh, climatic change, there was complex, you know, there was cosmic radiation. Uh, we brought diseases from Africa that, that helped to kill them off. Um, 
I mean, there could have been different factors at work in different regions, but overall, I think that we were a more successful species in terms of our ability to cooperate within our own groups. We had larger group sizes, more networking. We developed, a, if you like, a better knowledge base of the environments and, and, and were able to map these environments and move into environments that these earlier humans couldn't really deal with. So we find Homo sapiens moving into dense rainforests, into desert regions, into really cold regions that the Neanderthals couldn't get into. So our culture, our technology lets us live in these environments. It gives us this extra adaptive capacity. Um, so that must have been a contribution as well, that we have a maybe a greater versatility and ability to extract more from the environment. So using traps and nets and complex technology, you know, we can really gather food uh, in a way that perhaps these earlier species weren't able to do. So we really kind of exploit more intensively the environment um, than these other humans could do. And that would have supported greater numbers of people. And maybe some people think we're just also a more efficient kind of physiologically, a more efficient kind of human. So some estimates suggest that the Neanderthals had 20% bigger lungs than we do. Uh, their, their, their organs in the trunk were bigger. Um, they were using more energy. Um, so they needed those bigger lungs to fuel that, that energy cost. Um, we get by with less energy demands. We overall have less muscle than the Neanderthals did. Um, so perhaps we're a slightly more economic model of human as well, which means you can support more Homo sapiens on a landscape than you can support Neanderthals. But I think these are like really, um, I think my minor arguments in a way, because we see a lot of variation in sapiens as well, right? Um, Absolutely, yes. And, and I think that you know, Homo sapiens went extinct too. So we weren't uh, perfectly adapted. We see many cases in the past where groups of Homo sapiens died out and Homo sapiens replaced other Homo sapiens many times. So being a Homo sapiens wasn't the automatic key to success. And at times the Neanderthals may have actually done better than Homo sapiens. We have yeah. an interesting situation in Greece. So there's a site called Apidema uh, that I've been involved in studying. Kater Katerina Havati has led the work there. And remarkably, you've got what seems to be an early Homo sapiens fossil over 200,000 years ago, um, which is the oldest Homo sapiens fossil outside of Africa, if we're right about it. It's only the back of a skull, so we have to be a little bit careful, but it looks like a Homo sapiens from the back of the skull. It's there over 200,000 years ago, and yet in the site, of Epidema, we then have a Neanderthal fossil at maybe 170,000 years ago. So there you've got the reverse situation. First you have Homo sapiens, and then you have Neanderthals. So did the Neanderthals replace the Homo sapiens? It, it's possible. Um, and in, in France, I've been involved with work at a, at a site. Uh, so Ludovic Slimak has been in, working on this site of Grot Mondran in the Rhone Valley in France, southern France. And there we have a sequence of First of all, Neanderthals. Um, then, about 54,000 years ago, a brief appearance of Homo sapiens, and then the Neanderthals come back. So again, it's it's kind of a reverse of the situation. The Homo sapiens has disappeared, and the Neanderthals have taken over. So it wasn't an automatic thing. And I think that if, yeah, sure, if, if, if evolution proceeded in a slightly different way, Maybe Homo sapiens would not have been the success if we can call ourselves a success um, the way the world is today. Maybe it's questionable whether it's a success. But anyway, mm -hmm. in terms of numbers uh, and in terms of being the only species around, yes, we, we look as though we're successful. But I think if you changed a few parameters in the past, maybe we would never have evolved to the dominant position we're in now. And maybe the Neanderthals would have done or maybe the Denisovans would have done. Um, it could have been a different story if you changed some of the parameters. So there was nothing inevitable about our success, if you can call it that. But there is always this bigger brain argument, which is uh, proposed uh, for the for for the evolution of Homo sapiens. That, that that's why we survived. Yes, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, the fact we're here now it means we did something right along the way. But I think that. In some ways, we may have got lucky. 
Um, we did have things on our side. Our culture is very complex. I'm sure that our, our sophisticated technology was a big part of our success. So it wasn't about physical bodies. We weren't stronger than the Neanderthals. We didn't even have bigger brains than Neanderthals. And there's maybe some evidence that our brains had um, you know, a greater density of neurons, for example, that may have given us a cognitive advantage. But the Neanderthals were certainly not stupid. They were, you know, they survived for hundreds of thousands of years under very difficult and challenging conditions. And they couldn't have done that without being highly intelligent humans. So I think the gap between us and the Neanderthals has really narrowed in, in the last 20 years. Some people think it's disappeared. I don't go that far, but it's certainly narrowed. So I think the, you know, the balance between survival and extinction is, is a fine one. And, uh, you know, yes, we, we were successful, but I think it wasn't inevitable. And what about some of the other tools like fire and uh, language, for example? Uh, do we do we know uh, something about these in other hominins? Uh, some people think they know about the origin of language, and I'm really trying to steer clear of that. It's something I'm not an expert on. Uh, I think that when we look at even certainly the Neanderthals, I think that their way of life is so complex uh, that they must have had language. They must have been talking to each other. Um, in, a, in a fairly human way. And certainly their language could have been simpler. I think language evolves out of social complexity. So if they lived in smaller groups um, and they weren't networking as widely and their lives were a bit simpler, then their language would have been simpler. So I think it, it may not have been a language of the complexity we're using now, but I would certainly give the Neanderthals language. And probably it was there 500,000 years ago. We've got a site in Britain, Boxgrove, um, often attributed to Homo heidelbergensis. We've got a couple of human fossils from there and, and beautiful examples of the technology, uh, these beautifully made hand axes being used to butcher horses and deer. Even rhinos were being uh, butchered. Uh, and those are really dangerous animals. So these people, close to 500,000 years ago, were able to uh, acquire rhino carcasses and butcher them systematically um, over a long period of time on a dangerous landscape where you've got hyenas and lions and wolves and bears. And these humans were in possession of those carcasses, maybe 30 people, probably whole families butchering these rhinos in that landscape. And again, I think that suggests that, you know, they've got to have some kind of language to be able to, to perform at that level um, in these dangerous landscapes and survive there. And what about and the fire? fire? You mentioned okay. fire, yes. So I think for fire, certainly the Neanderthals at times had the ability to make fire. There are, there are enough sites where we have evidence of fire. Um, we've got sites in Britain at 400,000 years where we seem to have evidence of fire. So I think it goes back that far. You can argue in the early stages, people were maybe capturing natural fires and keeping them alive. But I think there are enough examples now that people probably did have that ability um, 400,000 years ago. There are suggestions for 800,000 years ago. There are recent claims that Homo naledi, this very small-brained human uh, in South Africa, was using fire um, 300,000 years ago uh, in the deep cave systems where they were uh, going at times. And uh, we await the publication of that data to see whether it's, uh, it's, it's really well-founded. But certainly fire was in use um, over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, on its own, it was not a key to our success. It was it was part of our success. Obviously, once you can make fire regularly, you've got protection from wild animals. You've got a technology that can help you in, in making stone tools and um, hardening wooden spears. It provides a social focus. Uh, people, it extends your daylight time. You can sit around the fire and start to tell stories to each other. So it's a social focus. And obviously, you can cook food, uh, you can cook your meat, you can kill pathogens, you can make the food more digestible. So that will be a big advantage as well. But the interesting thing is that, you know, there are people today who actually prefer eating raw meat. And it, it was like that in the past. So in the Neanderthals, for example, um, you know, I was involved in excavations in Gibraltar in the 1990s at Neanderthal sites. And we had halves there where you would find some 
clearly blackened bones that have been burnt in the fire, but then you will find other bones that have been broken open to extract the marrow, and it looks like the Neanderthals were quite happy to just eat that marrow raw. Um, and so they didn't always cook food. Uh, sometimes they preferred to just eat it as it was. Yeah, why to modify uh, the taste of it, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, they just preferred it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I of course, you already mentioned the major gaps between our knowledge, but what do you think, like, the, the things that you would like to highlight, the, these are the major questions, according to you? Yeah, so obviously we've mentioned the relationships of some of these humans, so we've got a, a reasonable fix on the relationship of us and the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, but how does Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi, Homo luzonensis, how do they relate to us? So I think those are big questions. We've got the mystery of who the Denisovans really were. Are these Chinese fossils actually Denisovans? That will be a great question to answer. And the many gaps on the map, I've mentioned obviously the, the huge areas of Africa with no fossils so far, huge areas of Asia and Southeast Asia. The fact that we've got on in the Philippines and on Flores, these strange, primitive, small brain dwarfed humans. Um, how many other islands in Southeast Asia could be telling the same story? Will we find that each of these islands had their own characteristic, strange kind of human living on it? That's an exciting possibility too. So I think there are many gaps that we need to fill in the fossil record uh, and chronological gaps too. We've mentioned the early part of the hominin story between four and seven million years ago. The fact that, you know, in Chad, that's now desert, you've got, you know, possible hominins living there six or seven million years ago. Again, looking at that area, there must be many more finds to come from that region alone. So earlier in time, even more gaps to fill in our story. Yeah, and also we didn't talk about, for example, uh, Americas, right? Like um, in the southern or northern part, like what what was going there, etc. In the Americas, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on that area, and it's very controversial. So at times we get claims of the presence of humans in America. Uh, there was a claim for presence of humans in America even 130,000 years ago, based on supposedly butchered um, elephant material. Um, I mean, the main evidence. And the genetic evidence supports it too, that, that the arrival of humans in the Americas is, is the last 20,000 years or so. But it's certainly possible that there were earlier forays there. Australia too, the conventional view based, based on DNA is that humans got into Australia maybe 50,000 years ago. But there's at least one site in northern Australia, Magia Bebi 2, where you've got evidence of complex technology and pigment use in what seems to be a really deep sequence, well-dated sequence going back 65,000 years. So the, the genetic data says the arrival time should be 50,000 or so, and then you've got a site dated at 65,000 years. So who was there? Um, or is the site wrongly dated? So again, another big question there, that we could have these earlier dispersals of Homo sapiens, and I mentioned one in Greece, more than 200,000 years ago, perhaps, there could be earlier dispersers of Homo sapiens that we haven't even been able to map yet. Yeah, so with all this um, knowledge, can we also predict the future of human evolution? Um, yeah, I often get asked that one, and it's it's one of the most difficult things to answer. And, uh, you know, there is no, I mean, the fact is evolution doesn't have a forward look. Evolution is about what works now. So you can't really project forward. Uh, you know, you sometimes see these uh, incredible weird reconstructions of stick-like humans with great big brains. And I think that's one of the things we can say isn't likely to happen because remarkably, there's data suggesting our brains have got smaller in the last 10,000 years or so compared with our ancestors from 10 or 20,000 years ago. So uh, brain evolution is even going to a smaller size rather than a larger size. And I think the the major threat, of course, is climate change. So I think we can't really talk about a long-term future for humanity until we get past the next couple of hundred years where we're going to see more climate change than humans have ever suffered in their entire evolutionary history. And that's going to happen on a very short time scale unless we do something about it. And um, so I think the major challenge is, you know, how many humans will, will be around on the Earth in a couple of hundred years? 
uh, if we get these very severe uh, environmental changes, which are predicted if we go to a, an Earth that's four or five degrees warmer. So, yeah, sorry to end on such a serious note, but I think that is the biggest challenge before we can talk about a longer term future for humanity and how we will evolve. No, it's, it's a great note and message, I think, because um, on one side, of course, we should embrace that we exist. We have developed and managed to uh, evolve and develop these kind of technologies, etc. But on the other hand, uh, we need to understand the challenges that we have and uh, how to deal with that. So, yeah, th th that's a great note, I think. Yes, I think so. And we have to remember that, that we've got this wonderful evolutionary history going through all these challenges. And we've got one of the biggest challenges facing us now. And it's mostly our own fault. <laughs> exactly. So if we were the smarter, smartest one, I think we'll be able to deal with this one as well. Right? Let's hope so. Yeah. Let's hope we can live up to the name Homo sapiens, wise humans. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So thank you so much for accepting the invitation. And uh, I really like the, the way you described and also uh, you mentioned already the gaps in our knowledge. You know, that's the best part uh, about yes. the conversation. Yes. So yes. thank you so much. Scientifically exciting times to come. Undoubtedly. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.